we're very pleased this evening to have Rafe Sagarin. Uh, he's a marine biologist who works with Biosphere 2. His topic tonight are Desert Sea, the changing fate of the Gulf of California. So please give a big round of applause and a welcome to Dr. Rafe Sagarin. Um, thank you so much, Shippard, um, and the College of Science, and all of you for coming out. The biggest question I get when I tell people on an airplane or even people in town that I'm a marine biologist and I live in Tucson, they, they always ask me, what is a marine biologist doing in the desert? Um, and that gets me started on uh, what I'm going to talk to you uh, about today, which is that, yes, we live in this Sonoran Desert, and the University of Arizona is in the Sonoran Desert, but it's really part of an ocean system. And as it gets darker, you'll be able to see these slides better. But what I have up here is a map of the Gulf of California, or the Sea of Cortez. It's the inland sea between the Baja California Peninsula and mainland Mexico. And as any of you who have spent time in Rocky Point or Puerto, uh, Punta Penasco know, uh, it is only a few hours from Tucson. In fact, uh, it is no further for me to drive down to the Gulf of California from here than my drive from uh, my previous post at Duke University to the coast. No one ever questioned a marine biologist at Duke University, but for some reason, marine biology and the desert doesn't seem to go together. And so I'm trying to dis dispel this myth that deserts and seas are so separate, especially here. Um, you can go and see landscapes in the Gulf of California that look just like landscapes right up here in the Catalina Mountains, except when you look out, you see the ocean. Um, and that's pretty amazing. And of course, we're connected to the sea as well through the Colorado River system. Or I should say we're disconnected to the sea through the Colorado River because we've taken so much water out of there that the Colorado River, which used to flow to the northern end of the Gulf of California, no longer reaches the Gulf. And these incredible wetlands that people like Aldo Leopold wrote about at the turn of the century are really no longer there, except that you've probably read in the news that there's an exciting project going on now to release some water back to the natural habitat of the Colorado River Delta. And although I'm not directly part of this project, uh, some of the people, including Carl Flessa at the University of Arizona, um, and my friend Eloise Kendi with the Nature Conservancy, were kind enough to share some photos with, uh, with me of this recent project that just happened in March to release water from the Colorado. It's not going to go all the way to the Gulf of California, but it's really feeding these wetland systems in the Delta. Um, I wish that it was a little darker so you could see these photos. This is an overlay map um, of the different places where there are restoration projects. I'll just tell you because you probably can't see it that there are some great projects going on uh, to restore uh, some amazing riparian riverside habitat. And all those projects need is just a little bit of water, and they are really going to take off, people think. Um, this is an overhead photo, and I'm, uh, I, I can share all of these slides with you if you just send me an email um, of the water actually being released and going down this bone dry riverbank and coming into a system. Um, Dale Turner with the Nature Conservancy is taking repeated photographs from the same areas in the Delta. And um, this one that's up there, it's very white because it's just a sandy playa. The very next photo is exactly the same area after the water's been released. And I don't know if you can see it, but it is a lush, gorgeous wetland full of water. It is truly uh, a testament to the fact that we actually can take a little back, give a little back to nature, um, and make, make some things work that have been broken for a long time. And to me, this is one of the most hopeful stories about the desert sea environment, is that if we can just put a little water back, we can make a huge difference. Um, Francisco Zamora and the Sonoran Institute have estimated even just 1% back from the Colorado River that we take now could actually restore flow on occasion to the Gulf of California and do wonderful things for these wetlands. And I think everyone here could imagine, no matter how water-starved we are, we could all use 1% less water 
in our daily lives. I think anyone could get around that, that idea. So that's a really exciting thing about living on this uh, desert and sea um, connection. In fact, the desert sea, as I call this Gulf of California, is really a window into environmental change everywhere. This Gulf of California shows us what a bountiful past we had here. It shows us the challenges of today, trying to balance nature uses and water uses. But it also shows us a pretty hopeful future if we just commit a little bit of energy to restoring these systems. And one of my favorite stories about the change in this desert sea environment comes from one of my favorite storytellers, John Steinbeck, Pulitzer Prize, Nobel Prize winning author of books like The Grapes of Wrath. Well, John Steinbeck's best friend was my hero in science, a marine biologist named Edward Ricketts. Ricketts lived in uh, Monterey Bay in the early 20th century. Uh, he ran kind of a a kind of salon out of his laboratory. He had a laboratory, but it really was the source of these uh, amazing three-day-long parties that everyone in Monterey would go to and these uh, very intense philosophical discussions. And uh, he became very good friends with John Steinbeck as well as with Joseph Campbell, the mythologist who wrote The Hero with a Thousand Faces, as well as with people like John Cage, the musician, and um, Henry Miller, the author. They all gathered around uh, Ed Ricketts, and after Steinbeck had finished his masterwork, The Grapes of Wrath, and Ed Ricketts had finished his masterwork, which was called Between Pacific Tides, which was about the animals of the California coast, they decided to get out of town. Uh, Steinbeck was almost run out of town. The Grapes of Wrath was critical of the agriculture industry, and this is a big agricultural area, so he wanted to get out of town. and. They uh, hired a, an out-of-season sardine boat to go down to the Sea of Cortez, and they wanted to document everything that they saw down there. And they recognized um, that they weren't detached scientists, that they were going down there, and that they were going to be part of the ongoing change of this amazing environment. And this is one of the best examples in literature, in science, of kind of crossing that two cultures divide, the divide between art and science, um, this collaboration between this writer and this marine biologist. And they specifically went down there thinking, we want to look, they said, we went doubly open so that we could de de uh, describe a fish like the Sierra in purely scientific terms, in very technical terms, but they said, we could also see the fish alive and swimming feel it plunge against the lines, drag it threshing over the rail, and finally eat it. And they felt like both ways of describing a system were really important to how you understood a complex environment like this. And so they put their uh, descriptions, both the scientific descriptions and this narrative in a wonderful book called Sea of Cortez. Um, which uh, was authored by Steinbeck and Ricketts. It was truly a collaboration. Some reviewers thought Steinbeck wrote the written portion and Ricketts wrote the scientific appendix. And in fact, when this book is reissued as the log from the Sea of Cortez, only Steinbeck's name is on this shortened book, which only has the narrative portion, which is one of the biggest crimes in literature of the 20th century, that Ricketts' name isn't on this book because he actually wrote it. But nonetheless, both the narrative and the scientific uh, parts of this book are an incredible record of what the Gulf looked like in 1940. And they are just filled with passages like this about Cabo San Lucas. The night was extremely dark when we rounded the end. The coast pilot, that was their guidebook, spoke of a light at the end of San Lucas Pier, but we could see no light. Imagine Cabo San Lucas with no lights whatsoever. You can actually see Cabo San Lucas from space now. It's so developed and built up. And when they got there and looked at the tide pools, they said the exposed rocks were ferocious with life. And these were guys coming from some of the richest tide pools in the world in Central California, and they were blown away by what they saw uh, near Cabo San Lucas. They would say things like, we saw millions of sea cucumbers and brittle stars hundreds at a time in black, twisting, squirming knots. Um, 
and the beach being full of uh, the shells of the pink murex and one of their crew members finding them so alluring that he collected wash tubs full of them um, and great numbers of the, s of the giant conchs and the giant snails. Um, and they write about the fish, that the fish were many, that they saw the splashing of great schools of tuna where they beat the water to spray in their millions. So there are all these very evocative descriptions. Um, the swordfish around us played in great numbers, and great numbers of manta, sometimes 12 feet between the wingtips. And so I was very fortunate to get with a group of marine biologists in Monterey who in 2004 chartered a fishing boat that looked very much like the Western Flyer that Steinbeck and Ricketts used, and we went back to all the same locations um, that Steinbeck and Ricketts went to at the same time of year, and we looked very simply at what had changed based on their scientific records and on those literary uh, recordings of what they saw. And we used both the same methodologies, and we also used some modern methodologies, uh, more statistically appropriate methodologies, but we always had ways of comparing. The first thing we did is what they did, simply go around the tide pools and observe what we saw. And observe from the many hours we spent at sea going between tide pools, where I can tell you that we did not see schools of tuna in their millions. We did not see swordfish jumping all around the boats or great uh, uh, schools of hammerhead sharks. We did not see giant manta rays everywhere. Uh, everything in that pelagic environment was greatly changed from what they saw. Um, and one of the things is that these guys, Steinbeck and Ricketts, were also seeing a gulf that was being changed right then. They saw school uh, 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 fleets of Japanese fishermen who were really just clearing out the bottom of the sea, sh trawling for shrimp, and coming up with all this bycatch, the stuff they didn't want that was far more numerous than the shrimp they were catching. And they noted that um, when a species is thus attacked, um, the disturbed balance often gives a new species ascendancy and destroys forever the old relationship. So they always felt that things were changing. And one of the most important things that's changed in the Gulf of California is because we lost all those big open ocean pelagic species like the tuna and the swordfish and the sharks, they're still there, but they're in much smaller numbers, a new species has ascended. And that species is the jumbo squid. So although Ricketts was familiar with this species, he would collect them whenever they showed up in California um, to sell as part of his biological business. They never saw them in the Gulf of California. Now they're everywhere in the Gulf. These are eight-foot-long squid. They are the new top dog in the Gulf of California because their competitors are mostly all gone and also because the water has warmed up due to climate change, and these guys like the warmer waters. So we're seeing changes coming from a multitude of causes. Now, Steinbeck and Ricketts were really into this idea of holism, at looking at the whole picture of things, uh, everything from what people were doing there to what the animals were doing there, what the environment was doing. But they grew frustrated towards the end of their journey. They said, we couldn't relate the microcosm of the Gulf, what they were seeing right there in the Gulf, to the macrocosm of the larger ocean. They couldn't get that big picture. And what's happened is, just through the passage of time, 40 years or 60 years between their study and our study, we were able to make those connections because everything that we saw that had changed in the Gulf of California as a result of all these changes are changes that we see now throughout the world's oceans. So we saw the effects of overfishing everywhere. That's occurring all over the world's oceans. We saw the effects of new diseases that come up. So the reason we didn't see black squirming knots of brittle stars and starfish everywhere that those guys saw them is because in the late 70s, a disease wiped through almost all of the echinoderms, the spiny-skinned animals like starfish and sea urchins um, and sea cucumbers. Um, and really decimated their populations. And that disease keeps coming back in warm water years. Um, so it seems to be uh, benefiting due to climate change, this disease. 
Off the coast of California now um, is another example of this sea star wasting disease. It just keeps coming back, and there really aren't records of it from back before the 70s. Um, we're seeing shifts in the ranges of species. As the water gets warmer, they move their range northward. That's what's happening in part with the jumbo squid. Um, we're seeing the effects of development. So when we went to the tide pools near Cabo San Lucas that were ferocious with life in 1940, we saw very decimated, almost empty tide pools there. That wasn't the case in all the tide pools we saw down there. Some were still very rich uh, and abundant. And so what's really interesting, I think, is just this idea of all this change happening in a desert sea environment. Because if you think about change throughout the world, whether you're talking about human population change or environmental change, a lot of it is trending towards desert seas. Because more and more of the world's population is living near or relying on the ocean for food. And more and more of the world is becoming arid or water starved. And so this interface of desert and sea is becoming increasingly important to study and understand. And that's going to bring me to the part of the talk where I, I talk briefly about what we're trying to do up at Biosphere 2 now with our ocean environment, which we're calling now the Desert Sea at Biosphere 2. And this is a big project that we've really just started uh, this last July. And the idea is that we're building an ocean in the desert. Um, everything when we talk about this project is going to be in the sense of kind of uh, giving some people a little dissonance in their mind, like desert and sea, those don't go together. Why are you a marine biologist in the desert? All these kind of questions we're going to raise and then start to answer. Um, so we have this ocean, and this ocean happens to be a 700,000 gallon body of water that's under glass at the Biosphere 2. And for people who don't know about the Biosphere 2 or have a vague memory of a lot of news 20 years ago about the Biosphere 2, I remind them that, yes, it's that biosphere where it was a huge sealed environment that eight people called Biospherians um, sealed themselves inside. Uh, during this sealed mission, the Biosphere was actually more airtight than the space shuttle or the International Space Station in terms of air coming in and out. Um, and people lived there, these eight people lived in there um, for two years on the food that they could raise inside the biosphere. I also remind people that it's not the biosphere in the Pauly Shore movie, Biodome. That is a very bad fictional account of anything that happened at Biosphere. Um, the original Biosphere 2 was this experiment. Um, and one of the habitats that the Biospherians cared for was a coral reef ocean, this 700,000 gallon ocean tank that we have that was built to be a coral reef. One thing we know about coral reefs and something we learned a lot more about through their experiments is that they are probably one of the most difficult natural environments to keep alive in captivity, if you will, under glass. And our ocean has really deteriorated from these early days. We had a very rich coral environment that I would say was almost doomed from the start for a number of reasons. One simple reason, all the glass in Biosphere 2 is UV coated like your auto glass. Um, corals really like the UV part of the spectrum. Our skin doesn't like it, but corals really like it. And so they didn't have that. So they're missing in an important nutrient, if you will. Um, but there's a lot of other reasons why it was difficult to keep this coral reef alive. If you look at our ocean now, um, it is um, mostly the surface is mostly covered in algae, really kind of nasty algae. Um, there are some fish left over from the original days. They take care of themselves. They love the algae. They eat it. They have no predators. Uh, they do fine. Um, but it's not really a thriving ecosystem in any way. Now, um, particularly in the last two years, the University of Arizona has taken ownership of Biosphere 2. We do not maintain Biosphere 2 as a sealed ecosystem. Um, we've done that experiment in the original mission. So it's open. It turns out to use a lot less energy to keep an open system functioning. We can still control a lot of the environments. We can change temperature. We can add carbon dioxide. We can change the plants around. 
we can do pretty much what we want with it, which is great. And we're really sort of stretching into this space and figuring out what we can do with it. So when I came on, uh, we had this big ocean, and we thought, wow, there's really a lot we could do with this ocean. Because our mission at Biosphere, which is almost unique in the world in institutions, is that we are balancing scientific research, public outreach, and education, K through 12 education, as well as uh, s uh, teacher education, undergraduate education. So we're trying to balance all of those things. So we're not just a zoo or an aquarium. We're not just a science lab. We're something mixing all of those up. And so we're thinking, what can we do with this ocean that will allow us to fulfill all of those missions that we have? Um, balancing that outreach, teaching, and research mission. And so we developed this vision to transform this ocean into a living model of the Gulf of California, which will be much easier to maintain than a coral reef and much more appropriate for this region. So um, in this model, we're going to have um, right in the middle, an island with cactuses on it, just like you would see in the Gulf. And again, that's going to be one of these immediate cues to people's brains that sort of twist some wires in there to say, well, why are there cactuses growing right near the ocean? That opens the door to start telling this story about the desert sea. And we're going to have rocky shores, which are the places I like to do my scientific research. And we're going to have um, a sargassum forest, which is sort of like a kelp forest in the deep end of our ocean, which is about 21 feet deep. Um, we might even change out the little rowboat we have for a ponga, which is a more traditional uh, fishing vessel in the Gulf. Um, and there will continue to be windows underwater where uh, visitors can go down to a gallery and look in and see um, what we're going to have in the ocean. As I've mentioned, this is appropriate because it's our closest sea to the Sonoran Desert. And it's connected biologically climatologically and culturally to the Sonoran Desert. And that's a story we don't want to forget. It's not just the biology, but it's the human history and the human present that connects us uh, between the desert and the sea. Give a second for the bus to get out of the way. That gives me an excuse to have some beer. One of the big stories in the Sea of Cortez um, story is how much beer Steinbeck and, and Ricketts drank versus how much we drank. And uh, it's not a surprise to you that they outdrank us, but we tried uh, our best. Um, so uh, we think there's a lot we can do with this desert sea. Um, we're going to bring in a lot, not all, but a lot of the different fish and invertebrates. Um, maybe even birds, certainly a lot of the plants that we see in the Gulf um, to this desert sea. And it's really fortunate um, that we live so close to a place with so much amazing biodiversity because the things you'll be able to see in this desert sea are just incredible, incredible species. It makes me wonder why we thought we had to go originally all the way to an Indo-Pacific coral reef uh, to really have an amazing environment because we have an amazing environment right down the road from us. Interestingly, the Desert Sea will be a great place to do diving, and we already do a lot of diving there. Um, we have a number of volunteers from the dive shop in Tucson, up on Campbell, uh, Prince, Prince and Campbell, near there, um, who come up and uh, do work for us. But we are a certified uh, open water dive site, the only indoor open water dive site. So we can do uh, rescue dive training, which we do with the sheriff's office for search and rescue diving. We can do research diver training, high altitude dive training, and just recreational dive training. So I think that's going to be a huge draw uh, for this project and, and a lot of fun. Um, we're already getting started. This is a big, big project, but since July, I've been going nonstop on this project. And the first thing we did is we looked at this underground ocean gallery we had, um, which, quite frankly, was just awful. Um, it was really dark. Um, it had taken a lot of displays over 20 years that were all kind of mixed up. Some weren't working. Some were hard to understand. And I, we just said, let's start there bring some light into this gallery, 
and make this gallery the first place where people can see the story of desert and sea connections and also tell the story of um, how many University of Arizona researchers and students have been integral to our understanding of the Gulf of California. Some of the most important scientific work on the Gulf has been done by, Gulf of Cal by University of Arizona researchers, which is really amazing to think about this desert university producing generations of marine biologists who have helped our understanding of this place. We opened this renovated ocean gallery. Finally, our tour guides are proud to send our visitors down there. They used to say, the tour's over. If you want, you can go down to that dark space down there, um, but look out for spiders and that kind of thing. Um, now they're really excited. We've brought in a lot of natural light, painted the whole thing, because to me, the Gulf is a bright, bright place. It's not the dark fathoms of the ocean. It's a really bright, exciting place. We've brought in a um, traveling museum exhibit called Return to the Sea of Cortez, which documents uh, the story that I just told you, our expedition in 2004, and shows you all the changes that we saw during that expedition. That's an exhibit that has been in several natural history museums here in Mexico, and its last home is with us in Biosphere 2. Um, that was donated by, by Nancy Burnett, who was part of that expedition, and she was the creator of this exhibit. So we're really telling a lot of great stories down there, and we've brought in activities for kids, and we've got a couple small tanks where we're starting to display these Gulf of California animals um, to get across that. Um, this is a little hint of what you're going to see in the bigger project. And it is a huge, huge project to transform this whole ocean, but I can't think of a more perfect place to do a big, crazy project because Biosphere 2 itself is one enormous, great, visionary, crazy project um, that is all about making big ideas really come to life. And I see an illustration of this every day I'm up at Biosphere, which is that, um, I don't know if you can see this, but up until Biosphere 2 was built, the state of the art, in science of sealed ecosystems, self-sustaining ecosystems, were glass spheres about this big. And they were glass spheres that were sealed with some seawater, some bacteria, some algae, and they became sort of self-replicating, uh, uh, self-sustaining systems. They went from those glass spheres, and I have some in Biosphere that are dated 1989, okay? They went from that to 3.14 acres under glass. That is just an amazingly audacious kind of project, and that just inspires me every day to think, my project's not nearly as big as that. It's a big deal, but these guys really knew how to do big projects. So um, it's a great home for just thinking big. And one of the ways that we're uh, partially funding this project is also a big deal. It's a big deal for the University of Arizona, which has never done this before. But we're um, going out into this space called crowdsourcing or crowdfunding, where you just go to anyone, not just your big donors that you take to the 50-yard line of the football game, uh, but anyone out there, whether you're related to the University of Arizona or a complete stranger just interested in a cool project, we've posted this project on a site called Rocket Hub, which is totally independent from the university. They put on all kinds of projects, from bands that want to cut an album, to people who want to start a new business, to build an ocean in the desert, which is our project. Um, we've raised um, a good amount of money and a lot of awareness through this Rocket Hub project. So I'm asking you, if you want to get on there, um, share it on your social media. I've given on those flyers the link to the project. We've got videos on there about it. It's actually pretty fun to check out everything going on there. And it's really fun for us to see people coming from all over saying, uh, all over the world really, saying, oh, this is a really cool project. I want to give you $20. I want to give you $40. And there are gifts for every level of donation from you know, Biosphere 2 hats to overnight stays at the Biospheres to uh, scuba dive tours of the ocean. So um, there's kind of something for everyone. Um, so I really encourage you to get on that. That closes on uh, Earth Day, April 22nd. Another way you can really check this out, this weekend, we've had Earth Month all month at Biosphere, but this weekend is our ocean uh, focus of Earth Month. And 
One of the fun little projects we're going to do on Saturday, the 19th, we're going to release 5,000 Gulf of California hermit crabs into the ocean because uh, students that I've been working with up there have shown in smaller tanks that these hermit crabs love this nasty algae we have. So if they can help us with the job of cleaning up the ocean, um, that would be great. So we're going to release uh, those hermit crabs on Saturday. It's a great time uh, to come and see the project, see the new ocean gallery, um, and, and what we've been doing up there all around Biosphere 2 because it's just a hive of activity up there. Uh, we're really having a lot of fun with the whole Biosphere 2. Um, and so um, I'll just leave you with the mission statement of this Desert Sea project, which is the mission of the Desert Sea at Biosphere 2 is to conduct research while educating and inspiring people about the ecological and cultural connections between the ocean and arid lands. And that's a message that, as I've said, has global importance these days. So uh, I really hope you'll become part of this project. I welcome your feedback, your ideas. We're still in the big ideas stage, so we're really open to, uh, to ideas uh, and having you come out and see what we're doing at Biosphere 2. Thank you so much. I uh, hope you've enjoyed the pizza and the beer, and I am here to answer questions and to talk to you um, now and into the future. Thanks. <laughs>